Assalamualaikum and hello everyone and welcome to Malaysian Progressives in Australia's first ever event. So we're in the history in the making here guys. So yay. Uh, my name is Madiha and of course I represent MFOS in Melbourne and there will be a succession of events in Canberra and Adelaide and Perth and please keep, that, keep, up, keep updated with all of that as well. Um, in Malaysian Progressives we believe in democracy through dialogues and Midi will explain more on that. So, by the way, my name is Midi uh, and firstly I would like to say that thank you for coming. It's very encouraging to see the turnout. Uh, okay lah, strong lah, 30 because judging from experience in Melbourne, 30 something is good enough. You know, <laughs> uh, better than the rest of the... Events. Yeah. Okay, so what is MPC is all about, right? So, uh, what Madiha said is right. We want to advocate for reform and we think that the most appropriate way uh, to do that is through exchange of ideas, through dialogue and through debate. Uh, to sum up uh, the aspiration of Malaysian progressive, uh, there's uh, my favorite quotation. I'm not sure who's the first person who uttered this phrase. I think it's from uh, Harry Truman, but the first time I heard it is from President Jack Butler from West Wing. Uh, so, so what he says is this, that decisions are made by those who shows up. Uh, we from Malaysian progressive believe that showing up in a democracy requires more than just casting your vote in the ballot box maybe once in five years or four years. We think it requires engagement in the public discourse, uh, participate in the public debate, become genuinely informed, and only with that we can make a meaningful decision. That is our aspiration. And we believe, uh, and what we aspire is want to create a platform uh, to facilitate that process, or in simpler word, we want to provide an avenue for young Malaysian, which is us, to show up. That's basically the aspiration of Malaysian Progressive. So basically, maybe it still sounds uh, like an abstract thing, or what, what, what we're going to do next after we come up with the ideas, what will happen to the ideas. Obviously, uh, we haven't figured out everything. So that's why we want to invite everybody to join this journey, to participate in this process, uh, to join the mobilization of the young Malaysian progressive, especially in Australia. So, uh, that's all I would like to say about Malaysian progressive. If you want, if you want to know about, uh, more about this, you can ask uh, Madiha is available after this. You can ask uh, Bevin, you can ask myself. And if you want to know more about Malaysian progressive, come to the launching that will be held uh, soon after this event concluded, which is uh, at five uh, at Drill Hall. It's just the building next to this building. So uh, come and join us in this event. We uh, anticipate uh, engaging debate and meaningful dialogue. So that's all from me. I'm going to give back the mic to Maria. Okay, so um, as the very first event for our Malaysian progressives in Australia, we would like to invite Rafizi Ramli as um, speaker and in the underlying theme for today is is there hope for a two-party system in Malaysia so I invite Rafizi Ramli, MP Pandan and newly appointed Secretary General of Parti Kaedlan Rakyat and Midi Rahim as the moderator. Thank you YB for coming to Australia and congratulations for your appointment as Secretary General. I was shocked, I think a lot of people are shocked, maybe people will ask questions about that, I don't know. And also uh, for being elected as the Vice President of PKR, so I'm not sure whether are you uh, holding both position or? I, I am. Uh, I oh, am. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so cool. So basically, the format of the dialogue is this: very simple. Uh, for the next two hours, we'll be asking questions to YB Rafizi. I'll be the principal questioners, and when I think it's appropriate, I will open the floor uh, for you guys to ask questions. So I think because we have two hours at our disposal, I think everybody will have enough opportunity to ask questions. If you think you are being, uh, you're not being given enough opportunity, just maybe raise your hand. Madia will spot you, and Madia will tell me inside WhatsApp group or something. Or you can just shout midi, bila nak bagi soalan, something along those lines. Uh, I don't mind uh, because we want everybody to engage in the dialogue. So that will basically be the format of the discussion. So uh, to kick off, so the first question to IB. Uh, before we touch on the broader issue of two-party system, I think we need to speak about your party first. 
because in order to have a good a, a functioning two party system you need to have a party that can operate in those dimensions right so my question to YB uh, let's talk about the MBFR score the Selangor MBFR score first thing that I would like to address is that uh, the changing of lead, internal leadership of a party is not something that is uncommon in a Westminster system we see in Australia the Labour Party they did that twice in 2009, they changed uh, Kevin Rudd to Gillette mm. and they did it again in 2013. So basically, it's normal thing. But what I would like to focus on is the way your party handling the crisis. It started in January with a Kajang move, a different story. Then it only ended and concluded last month, if I'm not mistaken, and successfully created the biggest crisis within Pakatan. There is a news that pass is about to break off from Pakatan and successfully drag the mon even the monarch suddenly join all of the fiasco. So the po this is bad, why? Because this is a party that claim they are bringing the culture of uh, what we call that a major politics in the society. So why is this still happening in PKR? And I think you need to clarify that, Albert. Yeah. Well, I think we have to begin with the most important question. You have to ask the question whether it was justified or not for a change of leadership. Um, any party that goes into election and subsequently won an election can only be judged by the delivery and adherence to what they promised to the public during the election. We made very clear, you know, and, 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 and the way that Pakatan goes about governing is extremely different from the way Barisan does. It came to a point when uh, there's a, a big question of accountability, when internally, not just at PKR, but also at Pakatan, um, there's a big question mark whether or not the previous chief minister um, was basically uh, implementing policies or decisions that were in line with what we promised to the public. So that's, that's, that's very important. Some of the decisions were extremely controversial. Um, going about secretly um, agreeing to a massive concession, new concession on, on water um, industry in Selangor without prior consultation to the public, with the public and with party leadership was a no-no. Um, agreeing to a massive infrastructure highway, toll highway projects, which was highly controversial, not in line with what Pakatan promised, was a no-no, for example. At the same time, internally we were aware that the long dragging uh, his personal problem, which was he, he had a debt of about 70 million with Bank Islam. Uh, it was becoming more obvious that as it um, getting nearer to the final court decision, supposed to be in February 2014, uh, we got the win already that there could be a deal or uh, an out of court settlement. Uh, there needs to be a transparency with the party, with the leadership about the kind of settlement that he entered, because although it was his personal debt problem, but in his capacity of, of chief minister, um, at least the leadership needs to have a comfort that nothing would have been compromised because of the out of court settlement. So to me, before we go about um, analyzing whether the long dragging process was good or was bad, I think we have to go back to the first question whether it was justified or not for a change of leadership. And given all this, you know, um, the easiest way to do is for PKR especially, just to say that uh, ignore it, let it pass, and hopefully four years down the line, uh, we can change the leadership then, if we were to win election again. However, doing that, at least I personally believe, it's going to be a betrayal of the public trust that public gives to you. Uh, Pakatan Rakyat elects, uh, the, 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 the electorates of Selangor elected a Pakatan Rakyat government 
which was supposed to defend the rights of every citizen, for example, to practice their religion while they respect the position of Islam in the constitution. Certainly that did not happen too well in Selangor in the last two years. Uh, the previous state administration was seen to be dragging its feet. Uh, there seemed to be so many um, interference. The state seemed to be hesitant to be decisive in defending the rights of the very people whom we promised to protect in the first place. So once I think you cross the line when it comes to accountability to the public, any political party who is sincere about your duty to the public would have no choice but to make the decision to remove a leadership. Now, going about the removal and how it turns out to be, I think is a different story altogether, which you may want to ask in your next question, rather than, because I can go for okay. three hours okay. explaining about that. Yeah, you, we can, you can continue that during the forum, perhaps. So the question, I agree with you when you talk about accountability. So accountability requires <laughs> Uh, the the government or the party to be full frank and be honest to the people. You spend just now three minutes justifying the removal of Khalil Ibrahim. Maybe it sounds reasonable, but this is not the similar story that you told us back in January. You 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 send an open letter to a lot of people and you mention this idea and you open it to public. You claim that the reason of the removal is because the concern that Amno is launching a. Uh, a right wing attacks towards uh, in state of Selangor that will harm the order. This is exactly the language that being used by you back then. So the way I see is that why PKI have a problem of being honest to the rakyat even from the beginning? It, because it appears to me, I might be wrong, that the only reason why you you uh, tell everything about Khalid Ibrahim is because you can no longer hold that as a secret. Am I wrong on that or can you explain? Not, not really, because as of January, um, when the discussion began to take place, um, and part of the uh, biggest factors <coughs> that prompted us to um, evacuate, uh, basically do uh, Kajamu, um, uh, was because there was a series of demonstrations um, against the Christians in front of churches. It was unprecedented. A lot of people would have thought that, uh, I don't know how you were seeing it, from being in Melbourne, but never in our history, recent history, that you saw a group of people so brazenly um, threatening uh, another religion with massive demonstrations continuously. Um, there were one or two demonstrations and there was uh, a threat that it would continue on a weekly basis um, as a fallout from the Kalima Allah and the Bible issue. It goes back to what I was saying just now. The state government was seen very hesitant in protecting the very right of the people, the minorities in Selangor, who gave overwhelming support to Pakatan Raya. So, so there, it was a big factor. At that time, the discussion with um, the previous MB was on the possibility of him vacating the seat and of about the of creating uh, an option for Pakatan Raya to exercise a change of leadership should the need arise okay then you you, you can ask the next question how do you determine whether the need should arise or not um, of course it depends on whether or not he would toe the line of course it depends on whether he will be decisive in some of the decisions that we impose on him according to the party and Pakatan decisions. That includes some of the water deals, that included the, the way the mishandling of, of um, minority rights and so on. If, for example, um, these things would have been carried out properly by the previous SMB and we had uh, managed the a rising tension uh, caused by this demonstration in front of churches and so on, the need for a change of MB could not or would not have happened, maybe. That was why, for example, if you look back and rewind, at the beginning of the Kajang by-election, Tan Sri Khalid was all for it. In fact, he was the election director. It was because at that time, the discussion was still ongoing 
that you know these are a series of things that needs to be done at the same time we know that Anno was very focused about creating some havoc that they we need to be prepared should a change of leadership is necessary and therefore we needed to create uh, an option and that option has to be created because PAS and the AP at that moment could not accept anyone else but Tan Sri Kadik. So we couldn't nominate anyone else from amongst uh, existing Aduns at that time to take over from Tan Sri Kadik should the need arise. <clears throat> and the only person who was considered above that and would have been acceptable by all the three parties which you need their concurrence to change a leadership would have been Dato' Sri Anwar and therefore the necessity for Kajangmu. Of course, after that things, um, Tan Sri Khalid went different ways, uh, the other dynamics began to take place and, uh, and, and that's why by the time we finally executed a change of leadership in late July, uh, things were slightly different than what it was originally planned in January. I don't want to be fixated with Kajang Fiasco because we want to talk about broader things. So let's move on to a different issue. Because Is that all? Yeah, oh. yeah, you can continue. You can ask the question yourself if you want to after this perhaps or you can just come to the forum and listen to yourself. We want to talk about a broader issue, a broader ideas and policy contestation. Uh, because uh, Kajang Fiasco is not the only worrying things that we heard from PKR this year. If you take a look at the internal election, it was a mess. I think we all can agree with that. And uh, and what we can forgive that if the first time uh, PKR holds election, but uh, in 2010 a similar story. You you heard about a uh, fraud. You heard about a uh, result being cancelled and re-election being called. So the problem, uh, the reason why I have a less sympathy to what's happened in the, in the election because I'm not also have a, applying the same system, which is the direct voting from the members of the party, but the process have been been uh, relatively small. So how come a party who are advocating for reform have a trouble of doing it twice in a row? No improvement whatsoever. There was improvement. There's not much improvement in the problem. Um, so this, this is the lessons that I think any organization would go through, which is it's a very big gap between the ideal and the practical bit. It is very ideal to give a one member one vote. Um, okay, hang on. Okay, it is very ideal, but the logistics and the cost and the process to move 80,000, 100,000 people and to man an election of that size when you don't have the resources that a, an authority usually has um, creates a nightmare. And this is the big difference between PKR and AMNO. AMNO could spend millions and millions, use the resources of the government, use RELA. Uh, any government bodies that you can say um, so that these people effectively actually come in to run the party election for them we didn't have that leisure what we had was um, for every branch uh, division election you could only have about five or six people volunteers trained to man an election now if the number of people who come and vote is only 400 even then is already a problem because unlike a general election where you only have to select one candidate and is usually a choice between two candidates the process of one person voting is very quick so you can quickly finish 400 people uh, that's not the case with party election because a person have to select effectively on average about 50 people so one voter will go through, will take effectively about 20-30 minutes to finish one ballot. Now multiply that with 400 people and people come in very earlier on and because of the cost constraint we couldn't get bigger haul and we couldn't do it over two days so we have to finish everything within one day. So what came out after that is, an, uh, is a huge logistical problem and then the human factor came in. You know, people who came from quite far uh, took a leave from their job from, uh, and then suddenly had to queue for one whole day. After a while, they get very agitated, agitated and angry. So that's, that's the common problems, actually, that happen. It's a, 
it became quite unruly because of the logistical nightmare. And in some uh, states like um, Penang, like Selangor, the turnout was as high as 2,000, 3,000 per division. And, and, and the rest, I think, as you say, is, is quite history. It's, uh, so that's why we have to go back and, and revise and relook and try to match and close the gap between the ideals of giving one member and one vote with the logistical and financial capability of a poor party like PKR to carry it out. Because unless we have RELA, we have the police, we have the authorities to come in and help us, it's almost nearly impossible to carry out a smooth election with only 10 or 15 people stationed at one polling station for division. But I think YB, you are blaming on external factors because you as a strategic director... No, no, I, I did it. First. The, the reason being is, mm. if you know that you don't have the capacity to pull this off, mm. why buy more than you can chew? Precisely, that's what I said. This is the second time, it's not the first time. No, that's, that's what I said from the very beginning, which is, is a learning process that any organization has to go through. There's a very big gap between the ideals and the practicals. You guys have your ideals about the, how the country should be. You will go back, you know, more than half of you will just be sucked into your mortgage. After five years, you couldn't care less about what happens to the country. For example, there's a very big gap between the ideals and the practical. PKR as an organization started with the ideals. We thought that we could do it without matching to our organizational, logistical, and financial capability. We thought that we could do it again through some simplifications after the first election. So the first election, for example, we had a very thick ballot. The second election, uh, previously, instead of having very thick ballot, we go by numbering system. So that people only have one ballot, they have to put in the number. Even then, it was, um, it was problematic. So I think by now there's a general uh, acceptance in the party that it perhaps no matter how much improvement we try to do on the voting process itself, it's just beyond our means and our financial and logistical capability to carry out something like that. Therefore, that's why I think in the next party election, we would have to go back and revise so that we scale down the number of logistical arrangements and challenges that we have to manage. Yep, we're looking forward for that because I think it's important for PKR because they're advocating for reform. So, my question next, now after the Kajang fiasco and, Pakat and the party elections, what do you think need to be done by PKR to repair back the damage that has been, they have caused and the public confidence that they already betrayed? Yeah. I think if, if you are in politics since, especially since 98, la, the big shift in Malaysian politics happened in 98, and it happened again in 2008, you know. There was one constant feature of the politics of the last 15 years, was that the public especially always set the focus on the bigger picture, which is reform and change. And the public understands that the three parties especially and the other NGOs and civil societies, we have our constraints and is a learning process. But the public also appreciate the honesty the organization has. So I think it's very important for PKR to be very honest and to go back to what matters most to the public. And what matters most to the rakyat is your bread and butter issues. It's about how much you get paid, is about corruption, is about accountability, is about economy, is about whether we should pay for exorbitant prime ministers travelling overseas, or should we use the money to go back to education, subsidies, to reduce cost of living and so on. And this is what we do best. If only we go back and train our guns consistently on all these issues, again, as we have done in the past, um, because, as I say, the public understands the constraints that we have and the public appreciate honesty, combine the honesty with the focus on this, I think uh, PKR and Pakatan should be back on track uh, to challenge BN neck and neck in time for the next general election. Yeah, I think you might be right on that because the recent survey conducted by Malaysia, my Berdeka Review Centre stated that 
even though the support towards PR has dropped, but they still think that PR will retain the position as a government in Selangor if the election is to be conducted. Not only that, you know, the, uh, the, the, the survey has consistently shown that even even though at some points the support for PR dips from time to time before it bounced back, but it does not result in an increase in support for PN. You know, it's 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 it has been quite consistent for the last three like years. It's like PKR game to lose rather than. Uh, to win. not really. That means that more and more people will stay on the sideline to reevaluate. That's why the game is always open. You know, in in. My my view in politics is that there is no doom and gloom. You know, uh, somebody was telling me who would have thought uh, Zaid Hamidi now is a contender from prime ministership, given that 15 years ago he was detained under ISA and was, you know, basically in political wilderness for almost five years. So in politics, there is no such thing as doom and gloom. In politics, to me, as a party and as a political leader, you always have to be guided by principles and values. Whatever you decide on principles and values, sometimes you get the public support, sometimes you don't. But if you stay on course on that basis all the time, inshallah, you'll be on the right track because over a longer period of time, the public will be able to judge which one is more honest in the interest of the public and which one is not. And I think that's what has been happening, this, this competition between BN and Pakatan. Even though Pakatan and PKR commit mistakes from time to time, it does not result in a corresponding increase in support for BN because public ultimately knows that while one, while Pakatan Rakyat may be new and may be uh, flawed one way or another, Yet, on the other hand, you have a very corrupt and uh, insincere regime. So, what the public does every now and then is just take a step back and say, let, let me reevaluate and see how both parties go. Yep. I want to move on from PKR internal issues. I'll be opening for the floor to ask question. We'll be taking first three questions. Any question from the floor? All right, we have uh, one over there. Uh, okay, pass the mic to the next We'll be taking another two, no takers, or maybe next round. Why be Rafizi? My name is Danish. For the sake of uh, hard talk, I'll ask you a controversial question. Yes, yeah, specifically in regards to the Kajang move. I was just reading. This is uh, your. I'm not sure what's your opinion of RPK. The whole Kajang move was not initiated in January 2014, but was back in 2013. The issues such as the Bible, the Kidex, and the water issues only came became issues after January 2014. According to RPK, that's for you to judge, apparently there was a businessman offered Anwar approximately 50 million ringgit to the party as a form to induce Tansri Khalid to tow the party line. However, Khalid said no, and this pr prompted the Kajang move to happen. So that's my question. What is your take? Is it because the rejection of a 50 million ringgit business brand's plan? The second thing is more of a suggestion about your uh, about the PKR internal elections, about the finance part of it. I can't comment the logistics, but the finance. The finance, I would ask maybe if the MPs of PKR would sacrifice some of the salary maybe keep it to 40% salary to yourself and 60% to the party. Well, this is not, this is not uh, uh, something uh, figured out figure. It is practiced by Dr. Jayakuma. It has been practiced by some MP. No, it's categorically not right. Um, if only Raja Petra has the balls to be back in Malaysia, we would have sued him. But uh, he runs away in, in, in the UK. The notion that a Menteri Besar is changed because of 50 million ringgit is ridiculous. 50 million ringgit in the grand scheme of things is peanuts. There has not been a single evidence being adduced. Um, yet people should not forget that the, one of the biggest beneficiary of Khalid Ibrahim's uh, administration is Raja Petra's brother. 
who earns millions every month, every year from a high paid, highly paid job in one of the state subsidiaries looking after the water consolidation. So I think I wish that Raja Petra would have been a lot more forthcoming and um, declare his self-interest before he starts accusing all this. I can tell you the real story. Um, sorry? Maybe for the forum, okay. Your moderator said keep it for the forum, okay, all right. Now to your suggestion about pay cut, you know, Nick and I and Sim were all laughing because at the very minimum, uh, each one of us give, uh, takes a 20% pay cut. Uh, PKR, um, anyone, whether you are Adun or whether you are MP, automatically the moment you win, you sign a form that gives 20% every month of your salary to the party. On top of that, you also have to pay for the expenses of your service centre. I can declare here that I've never taken a single cent of my salary since I was elected. Because you use the money to pay for your staffing, you use the money to pay for your constituency expenditure, because we don't get allocation from the federal. And, uh, and you do fundraising from time to time and you do get some small allocation from the state, but it peanuts. So in the grand scheme of things, um, we are already skin to death financially in that sense. Uh, to give you a glimpse of how much it costs uh, to run a one-member, one-vote party election, um, if, say, 100,000 people come out to vote, um, and one ballot can be this thick because you vote for 20 Supreme Council members and then you have to vote for the various division and so on. If the cost of printing and logistics is about uh, uh, five ringgit um, per person, that's already like 500,000. After that, you have to pay for the rent, and all the others easily. I think in the last gen in the last party election, we had to spend about close to two million. Two um, no, two million is nothing. Two million is what they spend on karaoke. Uh, <laughs> um, but to us, two million is a lot. And I tell you, I rather spend two million on people <coughs> rather than on our party election. So uh, financially, it will continue to be a constraint. And while we have, I think, given as much pay as we have, uh, I don't think it's still enough. So long as BN continues to deny opposition's right to annual federal allocation, which is the case now. All right. Uh, we will proceed to a broader question of two-party system. Just so you guys know that if you feel what, a bit shy to ask questions openly here, uh, maybe afraid or... Of any, any, I don't mind, don't worry. <laughs> you can tweet your question, uh, put hashtag MPSINOZ. I repeat, hashtag MPSINOZ. So I'll be checking my Twitter from time to time, so feel free to ask questions there. So now we move on to the issue of two party system. All right. So you're talking about, just now you said that uh, there is AMNO. Uh, is controlling and preventing some of the uh, financial advantage to, PK, uh, to PR. That's something that PR cannot control. But one thing that PR can control when it comes to two-party system is by establishing a uh, shadow cabinet. It has been six years since the formation of PR. Why there is a reluctance from the judiciary of PR to nominate the shadow prime minister in the rest of the cabinet? It's, it's, the, the, there are two main reasons. Number one is you cannot have a shadow cabinet without a proper backing to make sure the shadow system functions. A shadow cabinet, whether it's in Australia or in the UK you know, or other Westminster system, will come with the full-fledged support for the office, for the research, and actually also for the power that comes with the, with the shadow cabinet. That means that there is a one-to-one -one marking. When a shadow transport minister uh, speaks, sorry, when, when a transport minister speaks, the shadow transport minister will have an equal time given in the house to counter. Um, they will have a full-fledged office running. You look at parliament that we have now. We have 87 now, 87 MPs. We only 
we are only given three space. Uh, one space is just basically the office of the leader of the opposition at the 14th floor. And then a meeting room which is about half of this room size. One third, I think it's like one third of this size. Okay, all the PKR 30 MPs have to cram in that room. We don't have anywhere to go. We don't have a place in parliament. You either go and sit in parliament and then during lunchtime you find you do the bawah pokok lah. You know, because there's no office, there's no desk. So if we want to do work, we have to go and cram ourselves in that meeting room. Same with PAS and same with DAP. Um, so we may actually say let's do uh, a, a shadow cabinet, but then again, you don't even have an office or facility. That's number one. Number two, for a shadow cabinet system to function, as I say, we must also have a parliamentary reform to give the right stature and the right recognition of a shadow cabinet. What you have now is that everything in parliament, the order and running of the house, is all decided by the government. If we were to put a motion, we'll be thrown out or suspended like and surrendered. If we give a 14-day notice motion to discuss an issue, what they will do is that they continue to put it as the last order of the house that after three months they will tell you, sorry, we have to finish all the dealings of the government because your opposition, your order paper is so last, we don't have the time. So that's why um, opposition's issues brought by opposition has never been discussed formally in, in parliament. So to me, the biggest factor is that doing the shadow cabinet is easy. Naming who is going to be shadow transport, who is going to be shadow finance minister is actually quite easy given how far Pakatan has been together for six years. But there is really no point having a shadow cabinet minister who does not have even the air time to speak in parliament. So unless you have to do the parliamentary reform first, this is what most people, yourself included, because of how alien the parliamentary system in Malaysia is, I bet most of you have not, have not been to parliament. You only see uh, Ibrahim Ali or Bu Mokhtar debating in parliament. No, that's, that's our parliament. With that kind of people and that kind of system, it's actually quite pointless to do a shadow cabinet. And number two, Midi, the reason uh, why I don't think it's top priority for Pakatan Raya to name a shadow cabinet, because we already have MPs who are given the task to speak on a particular matter or particular or to shadow particular ministries. Um, for each of the Pakatan Raya parties, um, we nominate one MP to shadow one ministry. For example, in, in this room, I shadow the finance, economic planning, and governance. So if Prime Minister or Ahmad Maslan or Husni Hanazla or Paul Lau speak, I will speak up again. Um, YBC at the back shadows transport. So anything about transport, he will speak. You have uh, Admiral Imran, MP for Lumon, who shadows uh, defense. Likewise, you have the same in DAP, you have Tony Pua who looks after uh, finance and treasury. Wong Chen from Kranajaya shadows trade and commodity. We do have this, uh, but that is as far as you could go. You could only just focus on speaking on certain topics because the whole parliamentary system does not allow for an effective shadow cabinet to function because there is no recognition for shadow ministers. Now, I'm going to tell you why I think uh, it's important to have a shadow cabinet. Two reasons, I think. Firstly, for confidence, because uh, it, uh, the list of the shadow cabinet will, will be reflecting the, the team that will be running the country should Pakatan win. That's the idea. So it suggests that uh, it, it can assure us that after P, if PR win, there will be a smooth transition who will be the Prime Minister, who will be the Deputy Prime Minister and all. Absence of that, and after the Selangor fiasco where PAS is res wrestled the position of MB with PKR, it shows that there is a lack of agreement towards 
important position, especially public position. So that's why I think it's important. That's one. Secondly, I think if the uh, the PR is already informally shadowing uh, for the for the ministry that you say that now, then why why don't you just have a shadow cabinet as a matter of uh, let the people decide? Because the thing is, uh, as in the concept of two-party system, you need to allow us the right to be able to compare and help us to compare it by making it easier by having a shadow cabinet. Then we, we can know that Rafizi is shadowing uh, finance minister. Then we can make a genuine comparison if you know you are the shadow minister. And third question, this is just for fun, uh, who is Hadi Awang shadowing to? <laughs> this, this, this is the I'll come to chat uh, who is Hadi Awang shadowing later. But this is the part where I think uh, there's a very clear uh, mismatch between your expectation uh, as electorates with what we have to push as politicians. Uh, you cannot just having a two a so-called shadow cabinet and a two-party system just in a form without a substance. It cannot be a brand, it cannot be a label, you cannot be doing it for the sake of doing it. As a politician, as MPs, we have to push for the real reform. A shadow cabinet system is not so much about who is Prime Minister, about who is uh, a Deputy Prime Minister. It is about the whole system. It is about this. We can't be going around shouting for free and fair elections without really reforming the very basis of XPR, cleaning up the electoral roll and so on. So it's not about the brand. You know, I, I understand this, this is an issue that we have been going about for six, seven years. But for us to say and just announce, okay, these are our shadow cabinet. You know? For the public, who are not privy to the failings of our parliamentary system, they would hold us accountable for a properly functioning parliamentary system when the reform is not there. So the failing will be on us, Pakatan Raya, not on the parliament or not on, on uh, Barisan Nasional. What you would have eventually then is a very flawed parliamentary system which the Raya actually think is the real thing. It cannot be. It cannot just be saying is that okay, here is a list of our shadow cabinet, but they don't get the chance to speak, they don't get the weightage they should have, they, they cannot push motions, they don't have support, because the public outside thinks that is actually is as good as a shadow cabinet system. So that's why the priority is very important. The substance is a lot more important than the form. And that's why we are pushing for the substance for first. The parliamentary reform has to take place first before you start naming people. Because names, as you pointed out, is very easy anyway. But what is myself as a shadow minister only have shadows. I cannot do anything. Because the public then, people like you will come to me and say, and there's a lalat going around here. <laughs> My shadow. Uh, I did take shower this one. <laughs> um, you know, because then... Oh, okay. Because obviously you people will come to me and say, you as shadow cabinet minister, why didn't you do one, two, three, four, five? Why is it that when prime minister decided to take 19 billion ringgit as his own allocation, why didn't you do anything about it? We can't. And for us to keep going back and say, we can't, we don't have power, there's no, it's, 